everybody um, from wherever you are in the world. Um, I know there's people from all over the planet again, in, including, I'm told, uh, uh, this month uh, a fair few people in Russia. So hello to everybody in Russia. Um, it must be, what, about 9 o'clock or so uh, there, so uh, it's getting on fairly late for you. Um, so today I want to talk about building and upgrading a PC, which is getting more and more important to people, especially as we're all finding not only household budgets, but also um, work budgets squeezed and, and, and money for new computing equipment is, is hard to come by. So when you go out and you want to buy a new computer in, uh, in a store or from a company online, you're not only paying for the parts, you're paying for somebody to assemble it. Um, so you're paying, you're paying for, for other things. And if you do it yourself, or if you can upgrade your existing computer to get more life out of it, then obviously you can save a great deal of money. But first of all, who am I? <clears throat> well, um, I am the author of the free Windows 7 Power Users Guide, which you can still nab at my website. It's 170 pages of it. Um, the Windows 8 Power Users Guide is coming out. Um, uh, that's been uh, picked up by a different publisher, so I won't mention it here. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and of course, troubleshooting Windows 7 uh, inside out, um, which is available from all good booksellers and from Amazon. And uh, troubleshoot and optimize Windows 8 inside out is currently being written. Um, I think I'm going to end up having, writing something like five Windows 8 books by the end of this year, um, and then probably falling over into a pile of goo. Um, I'm a, a Microsoft MVP awardee um, for uh, Windows Consumer, and um, uh, as they say, the uh, the rest of it is history. So, what are we going to um, what are we going to talk about here? Well, I'm going to split this presentation into four sections. Um, the quick ways that you can upgrade an existing computer uh, to get more life out of it, which, uh, let's face it, a lot of computers these days, um, even if they're a few years old, they'll still run uh, the latest versions of Windows because Microsoft haven't moved the goalposts is, as regards um, the performance that's necessary from a computer um, like they did, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, then uh, we'll look at how we can work safely uh, with computers, which doesn't, isn't, isn't just about uh, making sure that, you know, your health and safety is all right and you don't hurt yourself. It's also making sure that you don't break these components that um, sometimes can be very fragile um, and uh, that can cost an awful lot of money. Um, then we'll look at how we can choose the right components for a PC, and this, this will probably be the bulk of the, of the presentation, um, and making sure that, that whatever you get to build a new PC um, is absolutely the, the, you get the best value of it uh, that you can. And then I'll take you through the steps of how you can actually build a PC yourself. And it's very easy to build a PC, it really is because not the least of which is because all the plugs that plug into components and plug into the motherboard, each of them can only go one place because they're all completely different shapes and sizes. So it's really easy. I once went, admittedly I was with a friend who wanted to go um, for a drink, um, I once went from a, a, a load of uh, components scattered across, the, uh, um, uh, scattered across the living room floor to a build PC with Windows installed on it and antivirus software installed in three quarters of an hour. So it, it can be done, um, especially when, some, when someone's pestering you to go out, obviously. So let's begin by looking at quick ways to upgrade a computer. Now, by far, the easiest and quickest way to upgrade a PC is to add more memory to it. Um, up to a certain up to a certain limit, as I will explain. Windows, when it when it when Windows loads, it has hundreds or thousands of files um, that make up the operating system, and those files have got to be loaded into memory so that Windows can run and it can access them. 
if you don't have enough memory, if you're short on memory, then Windows can't load all of those files. So it has to still read some of those files off the hard disk. And the more files it has to read off the hard disk, which is considerably slower than memory, because it's, in almost every case, a mechanical spinning disk, uh, the more files you have to read off the hard disk, the slower Windows will become. So the more of those of the operating system core files that you can load into memory, um, the faster Windows generally is. So how much memory do you add? Well, um, it de partly depends on what um, version of Windows you're running. If you're running the 32-bit version of Windows, um, uh, of Windows Vista or, or Windows 7, um, all versions of Windows XP are the 32-bit because the 64-bit version was retired some years ago now, um, then you can only have in total a maximum of four gigabytes, slightly less than four gigabytes of memory in, uh, seen by your computer. And this includes the memory that's seen by your graphics, that, that's on your graphics card. Windows can only see memory in complete um, memory cards. So let's say, for example, that you have um, four gigabytes of memory in your computer. You've got, you've got four one gigabyte memory cards, and you've got one gigabyte of graphics memory on your graphics card. Well, Windows will only be able to, only be able to see four gigabytes, so it's, it'll, see the, it'll see the graphics card memory, and it'll see the first, first three memory cards, but it will completely ignore the last one. Uh, totally ignore it. In fact, given that the um, the amount of memory that can be seen is, ever so, is, is usually ever so slightly below that four gigabytes, it'll probably only see those first two memory cards. If you have the 64-bit version of Windows, then you can see more memory than, than you can possibly go out and buy at the moment. And, uh, and if you could afford that much memory, you probably wouldn't be looking to build your own computer. So which memory do you get? When we saw in that last image, there was a, I was highlighting a label on the memory stick. You can see that on this picture here, there's a little label on the memory stick. And you need to look at that, and there's two things that you need to match. Now, generally speaking, these labels are written in very technical terms. It's all um, product codes and tiny text. <clears throat> but what you need to look for are the memory type, which is normally DDR2, DDR3, and a megahertz speed. And this is on the memory cards that you currently have in your computer, because whatever you buy needs to match. If it doesn't match, um, it may, well, if it doesn't match, the PC may just may not start at all. Um, the computer, your hardware may not like it, so it may not start. So, <clears throat> and I'll talk about how you can work safely and pull these memory cards out in, in a little bit but you need to take one of your existing memory cards out of your computer, look at the, the DDR memory type, look at the megahertz speed, and buy additional memory up to however many slots you've got, obviously free slots, um, <clears throat> then that's the, the maximum. Let's say, for instance, though, that you have um, only two memory slots in your computer, and you've got two one gigabyte memory cards. But instead, you want to get rid of those, and you want to buy two two gigabyte memory cards. I would still buy the same type of memory. Well, it will need to be the same type of memory to be compatible with your motherboard. But I would still buy the same memory speed, um, because you know that that is compatible. You can buy faster memory, but what you'll need to do is you'll need to look up the um, uh, the model number of your motherboard, <clears throat> which is printed somewhere on the motherboard. So you'll, you'll normally find it next to the, the manufacturer's name. Um, and you can look that up, and you can see what the fastest memory is that it can support. But I'll, I'll talk about this more um, in a bit. The other thing that you can do easily is by changing your graphics card. <clears throat> so you need to make sure that there are uh, two things when you change your graphics card. Firstly, that you buy a graphics card that's for the correct socket type. There's the older AGP socket. Um, if you have an older computer, you may have an, an AGP accelerated graphics port socket. Um, and it may be a PCI Express. 
and it ought to say on your graph on your your graphics card um, what type of of socket it is or it might say printed next to the actual sockets themselves on the motherboard it may say what type of um, socket it is um, certainly if it's PCI Express it normally it normally does um, but again you may need to find the model number uh, of the motherboard printed on the motherboard next to the manufacturer's name normally and um, look it up to just look up the manual unless of course you have the manual that came with your motherboard, in which case you don't need to look it up and you just look in the book. The other thing to bear in mind when you're buying a graphics card is does it require additional power? Um, many modern graphics cards do require additional power and some computers um, don't come with the um, power plugs to plug into them. So if it requires additional power, which could be, as you'll see here, it could be a little six pin uh, Molex plug or it could be an 8 pin Molex plug um, then you'll need to make sure that you have a spare one of those coming from the power supply inside your computer um, if you don't then you'll need to buy an adapter basically a, a power splitter um, to give you these extra ports off the, um, off the uh, power supply so how do we work safely with our uh, computers when we're uh, when we're building and upgrading them? Well, the first thing to uh, remember is to always work on a flat and a stable surface. A nice wooden table is really good. This is actually a very nice wooden table. I wouldn't mind owning that one myself. Um, don't work on a say on a surface where um, you have, let's say, wobbly legs. Um, I wouldn't work on glass because sometimes you have to put a lot of pressure um, on components, especially things like memory cards, to get them to fit into the sockets. I wouldn't really work on glass, especially given the fact that you've got little bits of metal all over the place and you could scratch it. Um, and uh, don't move on a don't don't work on a surface where things could move about or they could they could slide about. You can use an anti-static wristband. Some people swear by them. Um, some people claim that they're not necessary, um, but you need to make sure that you that you are properly discharged, um, <clears throat> which is why you shouldn't um, work on computers where, if you're on something like a nylon carpet, um, anything where you can um, uh, rub your feet along the carpet and then stick a balloon to your chest. Um, you're uh, generating too much static electricity and a, a tiny amount of, of electricity. Um, on computer components is enough to short them out. Uh, you can normally um, discharge any static perfectly well by uh, just touching the case of the computer uh, when it's on a flat wooden uh, surface. And as I say there, <coughs> avoid nylon carpets. Um, they're very funny if you've got balloons, uh, but they're not very funny when you're trying to um, build or upgrade a computer. So, how do we choose the right components for uh, a computer? Well, the first thing to remember that is that uh, a PC, a computer, is only as quick as its slowest component. Uh, my little furry friend here. So, in this example, we have a, a processor running at 1,800 megahertz. We have a motherboard um, which supports maximum speeds of 1,800 megahertz and we have memory running at 1,333 megahertz. And as a result, the processor and the motherboard will only ever run at the slower speed of the memory. They'll be dragged down to that speed because um, otherwise you'll, you just get a bottleneck that the processor tries to, um, the processor and the motherboard try to communicate with the memory faster than, than, it, than the memory can cope with and the memory just says, no, and does it at its own pace. So, that, so everything slows down to the speed of the slowest component. So that's the, important, that's the first thing to remember. <clears throat> so what do you spend your money on? These are the three most important components to spend your money on when you're looking to build yourself a computer. Um, the processor, always go for the fastest processor that you can afford because it'll just give you the longest life. The motherboard, um, 
I would always make sure these days that you go for one that's got USB 3 on it and go for the fastest um, motherboard that you, can, that you can actually get. Um, the reason for this is that you may not be able to afford, you may get a, um, a 2 gigahertz speed motherboard or a 2.2 gigahertz speed motherboard or even faster, um, and you may not be able to afford memory that fast or a processor that fast, but the very fact that the motherboard supports faster speed therefore makes it easier to upgrade the processor and memory later on so that you can get um, uh, speed improvements because obviously the motherboard is the hardest thing to replace. And memory, go for, if you can, the fastest the processor and motherboard will support. And on these three components is where the bulk of the money, the vast bulk of the money is going to be spent. Um, it's very easy to, to um, save lots of money uh, in, other, you know, in other ways. So how do we choose a processor? Ironically, this slide is now out of date because two days ago, uh, Intel unveiled their new Ivy Bridge um, 22 nanometer processors, which are very, very, very quick. Um, Intel currently still um, have the, um, the speed advantage over AMD processors. Um, the Core i5 chips are the, the current price performance sweet spot uh, the K processors, um, you'll see all the all the, the Intel processors have got a number and then perhaps a letter K after. If they have a K, it means you can overclock it and you can get some extra speed out of it. But you won't be able to really do that with the stack heat sink, um, processor heat sink that Intel provides. You'll probably need to spend extra money, um, which can be expensive, um, on a dedicated better heat sink. Um, so that you can um, overclock that processor. But currently, Intel processors are the ones to get. Uh, the new Ivy Bridge processors are um, uh, going to be very fast, and more, more importantly, because it's a 22 nanometer chip, so there's, there's less um, distance for um, electricity to flow between circuits, uh, they're much more power efficient. Um, but the release of the new Ivy Bridge chips does mean that the previous Sandy Bridge chips will soon be dropping in price, and uh, you could pick up a bargain if you go with the Sandy Bridge chips because they too are uh, extremely good. And uh, what motherboard do you get? Well, I mentioned previously that uh, it's always a good idea these days to look for a motherboard that supports the USB 3.0. Um, standard, um, and perhaps Thunderbolt, which at the moment is only really found on Apple Mac computers. Um, so you probably won't find Thunderbolt yet. Uh, you may find the odd motherboard that supports it. Um, now, the new SATA 6 gig um, interface is only really if you want to have a solid state disk in your, um, in your PC. Um, now, with, with solid-state disks, you can have a mechanical hard disk, you know, spinny hard disk, but Windows can perform much faster off a solid-state disk, which is just memory. There's nothing in there. There's no moving parts. There's nothing to spin. It's just memory. But research solid-state disks before you buy because they're just like computer memory, and some of them are, some of them are, are blisteringly quick, and some of them aren't much faster than a mechanical hard drive. Um, in fact, I've seen uh, reports of um, SSDs that are actually slower than some of the fastest mechanical hard drives. So it's worth having a look online, having a look in computer magazines to see um, if you can find um, reviews of solid state disks. But the very fastest ones will need this new SATA 6 gig interface in order to work at their optimum speed. And go for gigabit Ethernet if you, uh, if you can. Um, uh, it's a, a much faster um, networking um, solution. And you may also want to look for onboard Wi-Fi as well. Um, that's, uh, that, that can be extremely helpful. <clears throat> so how do we actually go about the process of putting all of this together and building a new computer from scratch? Right. Let's take this through step by step. So before we start, 
if the case that you bought for the computer doesn't already have a power supply pre-installed, the first thing you'll need to do is screw this power supply into place. It'll just slot in. There's one, only one way it will go, and there'll be four screws at the back of the computer's case to slot it into place here. And in these pictures, you'll actually see the computer with all the components that I'm using to do this presentation. <clears throat> the next thing to do is to get the motherboard out. And we work on the motherboard. We'll get a few things attached to the motherboard before we put it in the computer's case. Um, because if we do these things after it goes in the computer's case, things can be unbelievably fiddly. So the first thing to do with the motherboard, again on a, on a flat surface, is to put the processor in. Now, there's only really one way a modern processor is, is going to go in. I do say be very careful if you've got, let's say, an, an AMD chip which still has pins on it. I've bent some of these in the past, and they're, they're, they're an absolute nightmare to, uh, to get back into place carefully without breaking them. Um, so always be careful of those. But generally speaking, there is only one way a processor will go into its slot. <clears throat> Once you've got the processor in the board, we want to put the heat sink on the processor. Now, here in this image, you can see it's got a, a stock um, Intel um, heat sink and, and fan combo on top of the processor. <clears throat> Between the processor and the heat sink, you'll have some silicon paste. Now, it's important that you spread this liberally, liberally over the top of the um, processor before you put the heat sink on. This stops the processor from getting too hot and from cracking um, when, uh, when it's in use. It's, it's vitally important. Now, when you put the heat sink on, it'll clip on to the motherboard. And this is one of those components that can require um, some force in order to be able to get it clipped into place properly. Some of the more uh, expensive heat sinks, especially if you're going to overclock your processor, some of the more expensive heat sinks screw in underneath and have bracing plates, which is much better. But the, but the free, the cheap um, stock coolers that come with uh, modern processors need to be clipped into place. So you need to be firm, but you also need to be very careful, and this is where this flat level surface comes, uh, comes into place. Next is installing the memory. And uh, the memory, again, can be difficult to uh, get, it into, um, get it into the board and get it clipped in. So again, with the board on a flat, level surface, you do sometimes need to apply uh, a little bit of pressure in order to get these memory cards in place. Um, but again, be firm, but careful. Um, and memory cards, there is, again, only one way. There's only one way that anything will plug into uh, to a computer. And you need to make sure that when you put the memory in, the clips at each end are uh, locked down. So step four, put the hard drives in. We, the motherboard is still outside of the computer's case. We haven't put the motherboard in yet, but we need to put the hard drives in the case. The reason being that uh, if you try and put the hard drives in after you've put the motherboard in, the memory cards will get in the way, they'll stick up, and you probably won't be able to get the hard drives, hard disks in the case. Again, at this time, you also need to install your optical drive if you've got one. Um, you may not even, you may decide you don't even need an optical drive. Um, anymore. Everything's downloaded off the internet or um, even Windows 7 and Windows 8 can be installed off a, a USB pen drive. So, uh, so you may not need an optical drive at all. You may decide that's not for you. But the hard drives go in. Um, they'll uh, slot in. Some computer cases will have um, special clips to secure them in place. Uh, and some of the cheaper, uh, the cheaper cases, uh, you'll screw the, the hard drives in place. You can, hard drives can be, especially mechanical hard drives, can be uh, quite noisy. So you can also get little rubber feet that they sit on, which separate them from the, the case, so that when the disc is spinning, 
um, you don't get vibrations um, through the uh, through the case. So now that the hard drive and the optical drive is in the uh, is in the case, and that the processor, the heat sink, and the memory chips are on board the uh, on board the motherboard, now we can put the motherboard um, in the case. And you may have some little brass legs for it to for it to sit on. Uh, the motherboard manual will show you um, if you do, if you need to screw these into the case. But um, the motherboard now goes into the case, needs to be very carefully screwed down because don't forget that when you uh, turn the computer upright, it needs to be, you need to put it in flat down. But when you turn the computer upright, obviously the motherboard is going to be sort of vertical. So it needs to be very, very carefully um, screwed down. Now the front panel connectors, these are all the wires that come out the front of the inside of the front of the PC's case for things like the power button, the reset button, the um, LED lights for the disk status and for power. And they can be incredibly fiddly, really, really fiddly. Take your time with these. Um, you'll find if if you if you connect, let's say, your power button or your reset button, and you find that that button doesn't work, it will just be a case of those two wires, the positive and the negative, around the wrong way. So take them off, and you can plug them back on. But this is the most fiddly job, and it's the one that you need to um, spend the most time on. Um, it's also one of the most frustrating, but hopefully it only needs to be done once. Some motherboards, and this motherboard you can see here, this little picture, come with um, a little block, and you attach the wires onto the little block so you're not fiddling around inside the uh, inside the case, and then the block just slips, just slots on uh, to the motherboard. And if your PC comes with one of those, it can be uh, an absolute godsend. The next thing to do is to connect all the leads. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that all the wires and the cables will only go one place. Um, so this is the case. You'll have um, a couple of um, power leads. They still come from your power supply. You'll have a couple of leads that will go onto the motherboard to provide it with power. You'll have a power lead for each hard drive and um, your optical drive. And uh, you may have a power lead uh, for your graphics card, but there won't be any more. You will also have your uh, data cables for your um, optical drive and for your hard disks. And uh, they'll need to plug into the SATA ports on the motherboard. But again, there's only one place for each of these wires to go, so it's impossible to put them anywhere anywhere else because they simply won't go. They simply won't fit. And uh, then, once all that is done, we'll fit our expansion cards, which includes the graphics card. And uh, perhaps you, you might have a, a television tuner card or something else. And it's very important at this point uh, to make sure that uh, where you've got fans, you can see in this image there's a fan on the graphics card and there's a fan on the processor. You need to make sure that all the cables are tidied and they're not in the way of these fans. Here in this picture, uh, the cables are all over the place. And you can get some, uh, some cable ties and you can secure them uh, tidily uh, with cable ties. And you can cable tie them to parts of the inside of the, of the computer's case as well. Uh, to uh, keep them tidy, but it's, you need to keep that airflow um, going because firstly it'll reduce the noise of the computer and if the fans don't need to work so, so hard you're also reducing the amount of electricity that that computer uses. So now we finish up, there we go, that's the computer I'm doing this presentation on. Uh, <coughs> Self-built by, um, by me, also featured in um, troubleshooting Windows 7. Um, make sure everything is securely screwed in place. Um, as I said, make sure the cables aren't in the way of any fans. 
and um, when you plug it in and, and test it, don't put the side panel on. Leave the side panel off until you know it all works. Um, and uh, and when it's when it all works, then power the computer down, and then you can screw the side panel in place and enjoy using your new computer. So that's it for this. Um, next month, uh, I'm talking about managing family safety in Windows 7, and then I'm taking a short break for the summer. But in September, uh, we'll be back um, with this first Thursday series um, on. Windows 7 subjects, there's going to be, September and October will be um, an introduction to Windows 7 troubleshooting, and uh, October will be advanced Windows 7 troubleshooting. And then we're going to hit the road with Windows 8 um, su uh, subjects after that. So keep an eye out for that. You can keep up to date with me, but my website, thelongclimb.com, and on Facebook and Twitter, Facebook's always the best uh, place because it's the most active, and if you've got any help questions, you can post them there on Facebook, and, uh, and I'll, I'll answer them. Uh, I always answer as many as I can. Uh, speaking of which, do we have questions? Do we have a, a Q&A? We sure do, Mike. Your webcast always for a lot of good conversation and questions, and today's is no different. We'll just take them in the order they came in. We have a question from Shuli. Shuli asks, Mike, do you think that upgrading a several-year-old PC that has a Pentium D processor with a new video card and memory is worth the trouble? Um, it all depends how it's running. I mean, I've got, I've got a, a computer here with um, a, a lowly Intel Atom processor um, that I've got Windows, well, I've got Windows 8, 8 on here at the moment. And it runs absolutely fine. It's all down to um, what the if, if if at the moment it is really sluggish when you when you're thinking about upgrading. If something is really sluggish, then don't expect putting a new graphics card or putting extra memory in is going to make it make it like a new computer. It's going to make it quicker, um, and you'll probably improve the speed by I don't know 20 percent, 20 30 percent, um, but it won't make a computer that, that is behaving sluggish into something that's just come off the shelf. So depending on on what your budget is, you may want to, you know, wait a little longer and, and save up for something new. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Mike and Mike would like to know if you could address matching vendors' memory. Well I I'm not convinced I'm not completely convinced that this is important. Um, some people do, some people say yes, um, try and make sure that all the memory cards in the computer are, for, are from the same company. And certainly if you're building a new computer, then I would always recommend make sure the memory cards are from, are from the same company. But if you're upgrading a computer and upgrading memory, then that's, that's not always going to be possible. Um, you're not going to be able to make sure that all the cards are the same. So yes, certainly if you're building a new computer, make sure that all the memory cards are the same. You will get the best performance out of them. And if you can, try, if you can, when you're when you're grading, then try to keep them all the same. But um, I wouldn't worry too much. As long as the memory type and the clock speed are the same, you should be absolutely fine. <clears throat> Thank you. We have a question now from C. Poda. Um, they'd like to know if you could recommend two or three websites to do a quick search um, to look for like reviews and information about PC hardware. Um, if Tom's Hardware is at the top of the list, um, Tom'sHardware.com is an excellent website to go to. Um, if you're in the UK, PC Pro Magazine um, at PCPro.co.uk, they have. Um, some excellent um, hardware reviews uh, all of the time, but um, probably the best place to look is in your, you know, in, in your local store at uh, the computer magazines to um, uh, to see if they have any group tests um, uh, in the magazine that month. Thank you. We have a question now from Dylan. Um, Dylan says, on average, are 15,000 RPM hard drives slower than SSDs? The whole the whole issue with the speed of mechanical hard disks versus SSDs is 
can be fairly contentious because some SSDs, SSDs can be really slow. Um, so if you've got a, you know, if you've got a, a Samsung Spinpoint um, F3 or F4 um, mechanical hard drive, which are excellent drives, they're very power efficient and they're incredibly fast, then you'll probably be, you know, perfectly happy. But with an SSD, and again, try and find a, a group test. Um, here in the UK, there's um, a, a group test of SSDs and hard drives in, in this month's PC Pro magazine. Not that I want to plug them again. Um, and try and find a try and find a group test and look at the the actual performance of each of each solid state drive before you buy. That's very important. Otherwise, you, you can be wasting your money. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Kyle, and Kyle would like to know, Mike, what do you think about liquid cooling? Um, if you're a really serious gamer, then you can use li liquid cooling. I would personally would not want to install it myself. I'm, uh, I don't. I think that that's the sort of thing that you would want to go to. Um, you want to get with a PC that you buy, uh, you buy built from another company, purely because you have a warranty with it. Then, uh, if I. Um, if I even built a, P, a computer myself that had liquid cooling, uh, I did one thing wrong, then I could junk the entire machine. And if you're going to build a machine that's powerful enough to require liquid cooling, you're probably going to be spending, you know, a couple of thousand dollars on it, and uh, you don't really want to junk that. So I, I wouldn't recommend that you do it yourself. Thank you. And our next question is from Dylan. Um, Dylan would like to know, where can you get Windows 7 or 8 on a USB drive? I knew somebody was going to ask that. Um, you can um, create a, an ISO image of your existing Windows 7 um, uh, DVD using uh, various bits of software such as WinI, WinISO uh, that you can download. Just look for ISO software online. You can also download, do a search for the Windows 7 USB DVD download tool. This, will, this is a free tool from Microsoft, but you have to search for it, the USB, uh, Windows 7 USB DVD download tool. It allows you to put an ISO image of any operating system, actually, onto a, a USB pen drive um, that you can start your computer from and you can install that operating system from that pen drive. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. We do have a couple more questions coming in here. Um, Richard asks, Mike, can you recommend a high-end motherboard with lots of slots and everything? Um, not a specific motherboard um, because they change so, uh, so often. Um, but I would definitely look for – I mean, if you want a really high-end motherboard, you're looking for one that's going to have a BIOS reset button on the back, on the back panel, and you're going to – for USB 3, um, you're going to be looking for 7.1 audio. Um, these are the these are the things to look for. Um, generally, a high-end board is going to have a very high clock speed. It's going to have USB 3 ports at least two of them, and it's going to have SATA 6 gigabyte um, ports for um, fast solid-state drives. Um, and that would be that would be a, a, a good high-end board to get. Very nice. Thank you so much. Our next one is from Jim. Jim would like to know, for a Windows 7 64-bit, is it worth going from 8 gigabytes to 16 gigabytes? That's interesting you ask because that's something I forgot to mention earlier when I was talking about memory. You'll get a big memory increase going from 1 gigabyte of memory to 2 gigabytes. You'll get a big memory increase going from 1 or 2 gigabytes to 4 gigabytes, and you'll get a smaller increase going from 4 gigabytes to 6 gigabytes or 8 gigabytes. Above that, unless you're doing um, music production or video production or um, photographic, professional photographic editing or computer-aided design, you, won't, you just won't notice a, a performance difference going above eight, uh, 8 gigabytes at all on a computer. Thank you, Mike. Our next one is from Kyle. Kyle would like to know, what do you think, Mike, about using multiple GPUs and using them together? If you've got a, if you, if you're um, a gamer and you want to use multiple, multiple graphics cards in your computer, 
um, then you need to um, you need to, to, to choose which graphics card company you you want to be with when you choose the motherboard. You're either going to have um, an SLI um, equipped board, um, or you're going to have a Crossfire equipped uh, board. And either way, you're going to be locked into a particular micro graphics cards, either either AMD or or, or Nvidia. But generally speaking, you you know you you will get a a big improve, you will get an improvement in speed. But if you have two graphics cards, you won't get double the speed. You never will. You get about one and a half. You you add about 50% extra performance for adding an extra card. And sometimes, as these cards can cost up to you know can cost $500 or so, um, sometimes it's it's not worth it. It's better. I think to look for um, a um, a single graphics card that has um, multiple cores and um, at least two gigabytes, preferably more of GDDR5 memory, because that's the nice fast memory. Great, thank you very much. Our next one is from Jeff. Jeff says we are an independent studio. We want to build a few powerful machines to help us render scenes and characters in-house. Should we build it or go with a machine from a vendor like Box? Um, I'm assuming that you're a video studio. If you're a video studio, then um, there's no reason why you can't um, build them yourself. You can save a lot of money uh, by building these things yourself. Um, You'll probably want to go for um, uh, you'll probably want to go for twin graphics cards systems because I would imagine that you'll already be running software that was able to harness the power of the GPU, the graphics processing unit on the cards, which sort of takes the pressure off the uh, the processor. Um, but you'll still need a good processor and probably an awful lot of memory for, um, for a job like video rendering. So you can save an awful lot of money. Um, my recommendation would be to build one and see how you get on with it and see if it provides the, for the cost savings, see if it provides the, the performance boost that you require. Thank you. Our next question is from Fred. Fred would like to know, what about cleaning up the registry? What programs are the best to use? Um, there's only one really to recommend these days, and that's C Cleaner, which you can get at uh, ccleaner.com. Um, it's the only one to, to recommend. It's absolutely fantastic for cleaning um, unwanted files out of your, out of your hard drive and, uh, and cleaning up the registry as well, although Win Optimize is fairly good. Wonderful. A few more questions here. Um, one from Nick. Nick asks, do you recommend modding? Um, well, I don't, I, I don't do it, but um, one of the things to consider these days is um, your electricity usage. And if you're adding, you know, fans that have got lights in them or you're adding, you know, neon or LED lights and, and everything inside your computer, okay, the overall power drawer of those will be um, very small. But it will add up over a, over a year, over over two years. Um, it's pro I, for me, the the desktop piece is, is the desktop is, is stuck under the under the table, and I would spend my money on a, on a, a bigger screen instead. Great, thank you very much. Our next question here is from from C Poda. C Poda asks, what benchmark tools do you use for testing performance? What tools for troubleshooting PC problems? Um, I don't use any benchmarking tools because, um, for my certainly from my perspective, a, a computer is just as fast as it is. Um, the Windows Experience Index in Windows Vista and Windows 7 can't really be trusted because it doesn't give you a, a very good impression of how a computer will operate with real-world tasks. It's just a number. It just it doesn't give you a very good a very good idea. Um, and the professional benchmarking tools cost an awful, an awful lot of money. Um, and what tools for troubleshooting PC problems? Well, obviously I'd recommend the book for that, uh, troubleshooting Windows 7 inside out. But 
you'll find that all the troubleshooting tools that you need um, are already built into Windows. There's automated troubleshooters and there's lots of diagnostic um, and administrative tools in, built into Windows. Um, I've um, almost never needed a third-party troubleshooting tool. Great. Thank you so much. Two more questions here. One from Richard. He'd like to know, Mike, do you recommend disk drives that spin at 10,000 RPMs if you need a fast drive? Um, well, I, I would probably, if you can afford it, I would recommend going for an SSD um, because you'll get much better performance out of an SSD, even though the, you know, the, the, the cost per gigabyte is, is, is higher, significantly higher. Um, for your main drive for Windows on, um, you'll get the best performance out of that. But at the moment, currently anyway, the Samsung spin point drives um, offer the best uh, performance for a mechanical hard disk. All right, we'll wrap it up with our final question from Mike, who would like to know, what is the recommended minimum power supply wattage for today's modern motherboards? Well, you don't want to go with something too high because you're, you're going to want to watch your, your electricity usage. Um, but if you're going to want dual graphics cards, for instance, then you'll need something a bit meaty. I would say for um, an average um, enthusiast, board for just one uh, for an enthusiast PC with just one graphics card then probably a 700 watt power supply is is more than adequate you'll probably want to take that up to a 900 watts power supply if you want to use twin graphics cards but I can't really see any need to to have something higher than a 900 watt graphics power supply because that's really that, I mean it's very high that's like boiling a kettle so um, uh, so yeah 700 watts 700 750 is probably around the sweet spot